Hello Year 10s, I hope you're all keeping well. Today we are going to look at Chapter 9 in Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, Chapter 9, Dr Lanyon's Narrative. This is going to lead to Task 30 in your booklets. So what has happened prior to the extract that we have in your booklets we're going to read through today is Jekyll has written a letter to Lanyon asking him to collect a potion from his laboratory and take it back to his own house. He says his request is a matter of life or death. Troubled, but feeling he must help his friend in distress, Lanyon follows his instructions, but he arms himself with a gun. At midnight, Hyde comes to Lanyon's house to collect the potion. Have you got it? he cried. Have you got it? And so lively was his impatience that he even laid his hand upon my arm and sought to shake me. I put him back, conscious at his touch of a certain icy pang along my blood. Come, sir, said I. You forget that I have not yet the pleasure of your acquaintance. Be seated, if you please. And I showed him an example and sat down myself in my customary seat and with as fair an imitation of my ordinary manner to a patient as the lateness of the hour, the nature of my preoccupations and the horror I had of my visitor would suffer me to muster. I beg your pardon, Dr Lanyon, he replied civilly enough. What you say is very well founded and my impatience has shown its heels to my politeness. I come here at the instance of your colleague, Dr Henry Jekyll, on a piece of business of some moment, and I understood. He paused and put his hand to his throat, and I could see, in spite of his collected manner, that he was wrestling against the approaches of the hysteria. I understood a draw, but here I took pity on my visitor's suspense, and some perhaps on my own growing curiosity. There it is, sir, said I, pointing to the drawer, where it lay on the floor behind a table and still covered with the sheet. He sprang to it, and then paused and laid his hand upon his heart. I could hear his teeth grate with the convulsive action of his jaws, and his face's face was so ghastly to see that I grew alarmed, both for his life and reason. Compose yourself, said I. He turned a dreadful smile to me, and, as if with the decision of despair, plucked away the sheet. At sight of the contents, he uttered one loud sob of such immense relief that I sat petrified, and the next moment, in a voice that was already fairly well under control, have you a graduated glass? he asked. I rose from my place with something of an effort and gave him what he asked. He thanked me with a smiling nod, measured out a few minims of the red tincture and added one of the powders. The mixture, which was at first of a reddish hue, began, in proportion as the crystals melted, to brighten in colour, to effervesce audibly, and to throw off small fumes of vapour. Suddenly, and at the same moment, the ebullition ceased, and the compound changed to a dark purple, which faded again more slowly to a watery green. My visitor, who had watched these metamorphoses with a keen eye, smiled, set down the glass upon the table, and then turned and looked upon me with an air of scrutiny. And now, said he, to settle what remains. Will you be wise? Will you be guided? Will you suffer me to take this glass in my hand and to go forth from your house without further parley? Or has a greed of curiosity too much command of you? Think before you answer, for it shall be done as you decide. As you decide, you shall be left as you were before, and neither richer nor wiser, unless the sense of service rendered to a man in mortal distress may be counted as a kind of riches of the soul. Or, if you shall so prefer to choose, a new province of knowledge and new avenues to fame and power shall be laid open to you here, in this room, upon the instant, and your sight shall be blasted by a prodigy to stagger the unbelief of Satan. Sir, said I, affecting a coolness that I was far from truly possessing. You speak enigmas, and you will perhaps not wonder that I hear you with no very strong impression of belief, but I have gone too far in the way of inexplicable services to pause before I see the end. It is well, replied my visitor. Lanyon, you remember your vows. What follows is under the seal of our profession. And now, you who have so long been bound to the most narrow and material views, you who have denied the virtue of transcendental medicine, you who have derided your superiors. 
behold. He put the glass to his lips and drank at one gulp. A cry followed. He reeled, staggered, clutched at the table and held on, staring with injected eyes, gasping with open mouth. And as I looked, there came, I thought, a change. He seemed to swell. His face became suddenly black and the features seemed to melt and alter. And the next moment, I had sprung to my feet and leaped back against the wall, my arms raised to shield me from that prodigy, my mind submerged in terror. Oh God! I screamed, and oh God! Again and again, for there, before my eyes, pale and shaken and half fainting, and groping before him with his hands, like a man restored from death, there stood Henry Jekyll. So before we go over our vocabulary check slide, let's just take a minute to consider what has actually happened in that extract. So Mr Hyde has turned up at Dr Lanyon's house. He mixes a potion. He invites Dr Lanyon to leave before he takes the potion so that he does not see what happens next. But Dr Lanyon wants to stay. And in doing so, he watches Mr Hyde drink the mixture, this potion, and then sees him transform into Dr Jekyll. This is pure horror for Dr. Lanyon, and eventually the knowledge, effect, knowledge affects him so badly that he dies. So now let's have a quick look at a few um, words that you might find a little bit difficult in that extract. You may not, but we'll go through a few anyway. Where the extract talked about a few minims of the red tincture, it literally just means a small amount of the medicine or this mixture that he's making. Where it says FFS audibly, it again literally means fizzing loud enough to hear. We've come across the word audibly before in the murder of Peru and something that's audible can be heard. So this effervescence, it's fizzing, foaming, bubbling, loud enough to be heard. Where it says the ebullition ceased, the ebullition is the boiling and bubbling of the mixture. So where it ceased, it has stopped. So the boiling and bubbling stopped. These metamorphoses, that literally just means these changes which, and the context of this extract is he's talking about the changes in the appearance of the mixture, which Mr Hyde is watching very intently just to see the order that everything's happening in. Then when they say, when Mr Hyde says, without further parley, parley is a discussion of points. Historically, it can be a discussion um, of points with an enemy, but in this context, it's, it's talking about their discussion that Mr Hyde and uh, Dr Lanyon are having at this point. Then we have the word a prodigy. Now the term prodigy actually comes up twice in this extract. Um, it's a polysemous word, it's a word that has more than one meaning, like um, very many uh, words in the English vocabulary. In the one instance it's talking about an extraordinary event, like a prodigious event. So um, a prodigy is an event that's going to be very extraordinary for Dr Lanyon to witness. However, a prodigy can also be a talented youth. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Then it says, you speak enigmas. This is something that is difficult to understand or obscure. Dr. Lanyon says that to Mr. Hyde, as if to say you are, you are basically speaking in a way that is difficult to interpret or to understand. The reference to transcendental medicine is talking about supernatural medicine derided, where he says derided your superiors, he's talking about ridiculing or criticising them in an insulting manner. So Mr Hyde um, is accusing, is saying that Lanyon in the past has derided his superiors who were interested in transcendental medicine or the medicine of the supernatural and looking at that kind of thing. Um, and then we have submerged in terror. This is Dr Lanyon by the end. Um, where he's, he's literally overtaken by the terror of what he has seen. So he's submerged in it. He's covered in it. So we're going to go back and think about that Polysemus word prodigy for the moment. So we have the first time it comes up, he says, um, your sight shall be blasted. This is Mr Hyde says, your sight shall be blasted by a prodigy to stagger the unbelief in Satan. So he's suggesting there that, um, that Dr Lanyon is going to witness... Um, an event, an extraordinary event, 
that even Satan himself, the devil himself, would be astounded to see. And then later on in the extract, a bit further down, when Dr. Lanyon is watching this transformation take place, when he is watching Mr. Hyde turn into Dr. Jekyll, he says, my arms raised to shield me from that prodigy, my mind submerged in terror. So again, he is talking about this extraordinary event. But also there could be a double meaning here from Stevenson, suggesting perhaps that um, Dr. Jekyll is in fact some kind of prodigy of perhaps then Satan, because we've had that um, word referred to previously in relation to the disbelief of Satan. So if um, he is potentially a prodigy of Satan in a um, metaphorical way of speaking, in a manner of speaking, because of the fact that he wanted to dabble in this supernatural medicine or this supernatural science. So um, it could be here that Stevenson is using that language to suggest that um, that for all the Victorian gentlemen that Dr. Lanyon was supposed to be, we know he has this inner side of him, this dark side of him that is Mr. Hyde. And therefore, in pursuing that, in pursuing what was dark about him, he is almost become like um, a, a talented sort of youth or a talented a talented follower of this sort of evil science. Now, um, many Victorians believed that the devil made people do evil things and commit evil deeds. Therefore, for somebody to be committing evil, they were some way um, in alignment with the devil. They were some way being um, taken over by the devil to do these deeds. So there is a sense there of the prodigy having this double meaning. We see further evidence for that when Dr. Jekyll is first described as having a sort of slyish cast, as if he is hiding something and um, as if he is battling to suppress something within himself. We know that he is an educated and well-respected man. Therefore, if he can succumb to this, these evil urges, what does that suggest about good and evil, respectability and criminality? So taking this a little bit further, if we look at a few thinking points here, what methods does Stevenson use to develop tension and suspense in this extract? I would suggest you go back through, highlight a few words and phrases that, um, that develop a sense of tension and suspense in this extract um, and see why, what, what you can do with them. How do these methods then create the tension and suspense, explain and analyze them? So for example, as you probably saw when we were going through the extract, I have highlighted um, the part where it says our profession um, on the extract. So essentially, when Mr. Hyde says to Lanyon, Lanyon, you remember your vows. What follows is under the seal of our profession. It's quite interesting that he should say our in that respect, because Mr. Hyde, of course, is not a doctor. We know that Dr. Lanyon is a doctor, and obviously we know that Dr. Jekyll is a doctor, but Mr. Hyde refers to it as our profession. So Stevenson is dropping in little clues here as to who is going to emerge um, or what manner of person is going to emerge. Um, where he tells Lanyon to remember his vows, he is referring to the Hippocratic Oath and that kind of doctor-patient con confidentiality, or that all of this is um, something that he is not going to be able to necessarily um report upon okay so um it is interesting that stevenson at that point has mr hyde referring to it as our profession there is a little hint there there's a little clue about who is going to emerge then how do these methods create the tension and suspense you can explain and analyze as we've looked at the mention of satan in there and the victorian belief um, some of the victorians believing that it was the devil who made people do um, evil deeds. Um, look what other methods are in there. How do those methods create the tension and spank? There is a lot of gothic and supernatural elements in this extract. Why is this extract important to the themes and context of the Victorian gentleman, good versus evil and the duality of man? 
So you can think about how you might explain and evaluate that. Of course, this all links very much to Stevenson's intentions, the, the context and Stevenson's intentions with the themes that he was creating. So we have, um, think about the structural contrast that we had in The Murder of Carew, where we had the, uh, the maid witnessing two gentlemen, one the very small and evil Mr. Hyde, and one this very distinguished um, man, Danvers Carew, and we see Mr. Hyde murders Danvers Carew without, provo without provocation, he just murders him in cold blood. So we see there two sides of humanity, two sides of the Victorian gentleman, one that is capable of doing evil things and one that is, seems to be upholding that aspect of a, of a good and kindly disposition that his outward appearance reflects his inner goodness. But then that obviously is being questioned because by the time we get to Dr Lanyon's narrative here and we see Mr Hyde change into Dr Jekyll, we are presented with the fact that we have had this one Victorian gentleman who has had within him this evil, this darkness in the form of Mr Hyde, which he has managed to um, separate out from himself for the use of these potions and mixtures so that that is the, the, the aspect that takes over and does many of these evil deeds. So um, this would very much be questioning the, the role of good and evil, or it would be developing those ideas of good and evil. The fact that if it can be combined in one person and there is darkness or the ability to do evil deeds in everyone, what prevents it? Can, um, can the good and evil, can this duality of man be controlled? The Victorians had lots of fears about many things and this aspect of good and evil um, was one of them. So you couldn't necessarily tell that Dr Jekyll would, would be able to succumb to such evil or that he had such evil in him. As I say, it said, did say he had a slyish cast at the beginning, which does suggest he was hiding something or battling to suppress something within himself. However, he was also very much a very highly educated man, well thought of, um, he was a doctor and so well respected in his society as a Victorian gentleman. However, if somebody like that can give in to evil urges, again, where does that lead society? Where does that lead this question of respectability and criminality? OK, so those things all help very much to tie into the Stevenson's themes and kind of commentary on Victorian gentlemen, good versus evil and the duality of man. So finally for today, your task 30 then is three comprehension questions. Um, question one, what does Lanyon see that frightens the life out of him literally because this, um, what he has seen eventually leads on to his death? Um, what is the real mystery of Jekyll and Hyde? And how does Stevenson suggest that this is true evil? So see what you can find in those extracts pick out and highlight things to do with methods and then explain those methods in relation to answering these questions. So see how you can understand these questions. It is, these are comprehension questions. What do you understand from the extract that can help you to answer these questions and then try and take it that little bit further with, the, with your explanations and the why, maybe a bit of evaluation in there. Okay, thank you very much Year 10s. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. I hope you have a good day and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Bye.